The reading is found on page 845 in the Pew Bible if you wish to follow along. He was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us, and do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, Do not bother me, the door has already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up, give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given. You search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be open. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Last week, as you know, we landed on our call as Christians to be people, or excuse me, to be priests. That's not a good start. Uh-oh. Last week, we landed on our call for Christians to be priestly people. 
people caring for souls. And really the first order of business when it comes to being priests is being people in your community who, who pray for others. Priests need to be people of prayer. And so we'll be looking at how we do that. Specifically, we're going to be looking at uh, the mystic Evelyn Underhill, the greatest mystic, hands down, of the 20th century, and her prescription for contemplative prayer. But first, I think it's important to just explore why we pray at all. Why pray? See, folks, they, they're fed up with a boilerplate response society. Maybe you've heard about this. Maybe you're fed up with it, too. There's a large sense of lament whenever a tragedy strikes and the only response is thoughts and prayers, especially from politicians. And that's very true and a very good critique, I think. In fact, the very definition of taking God's name in vain is not saying a, a certain term that you shouldn't be saying anyway. Really at its root, taking God's name in vain is invoking our faith for vain reasons. It's uplifting our faith as an excuse to not do your job. And so I get that critique when there's a real pressing need and you're in a position to do something about it. You should do something about it. Church, I also think that critique's getting out, blown out of proportion. You know, it's like time and a place. Let me tell you what I've heard before. Uh, a few years back, there was a protest going on. It wasn't something I was personally called to, but I was driving by and I remembered seeing a sign that said, we don't need any more thoughts and prayers. And that one made me pause. You know, I know what they were getting at, but I kind of had to laugh. No more thoughts, no more prayers. Like, it's done. What I know now is what I'm going to the grave with. Same thing with prayers. We're done. I'm, I'm going solo, apart from our very creator and redeemer. Like, yeesh, good luck with that one. You know, the obvious truth is that we do need to think and we do need to pray. And really, if we are to think and we are to pray, we ought to do it deeply. Well, it's right that people shouldn't use thoughts and prayers as an excuse to not do what they've been called to do. Somebody needs to be thinking. Somebody needs to be praying. That's pretty self-evident. And that's really where we come in as the church. We are people who have been called specifically to be the people praying in our community. And so let me tell you, before we really get into uh, the prescription that we have for prayer here, let me tell you the difference that it makes, the difference prayer makes. Now, each of us probably has a full, full to-do list. Each of us, I'm sure, encounters a large amount of people each week, and each of us hears about more problems in the world than we know what to do with. So by the time we get to the end of the day, or especially the end of a week, we've inevitably gone off in a whole lot of different directions. We've had to wear a whole lot of different hats. And what can happen, at least if you have the same kind of luck that I do, is that once you're in that state of just sort of feeling disjointed and like you've been thrown around 50 different directions and been 50 different people, is right in that moment, that's when someone really with a, a pressing need will come to you. And what will happen inevitably then is that you'll just have to say, I, I just can't do that right now, or you'll have sort of a frazzled response. You'll give them a boilerplate answer, that sort of thing. You know, it's natural. We get worn out. We start feeling disjointed. Well, one of the many benefits of a life of prayer is that it recenters you, puts you back together, gives you a, a level of integrity. Now, that's the gift that I want to highlight for you all today. Prayer regroups you so you're all one person again, not 50 different people responding to 50 different problems. You know, after getting good at prayer, you're just, you have this, this feeling of being centered, able to tackle issues with your full self again. So if you catch yourself feeling uh, pulled in a bunch of different directions, you find yourself just not being yourself or you're frazzled or you just are handing off boilerplate answers and aren't fully there, I implore you to get better at prayer. Really, you should be praying for about 15 minutes a day unless you're too busy. If you're too busy, you should probably be praying for 30 minutes a day. All right. Now, with that said, 
A life prayer, it's often difficult to maintain. It's one thing to talk about, it's one thing to uplift and tell y'all to do it, but I'm sure you know there's times in our prayer life whenever it just feels like there's a, a disconnection or it's just not working or you, you feel like there might be something more. We've all been there and I, and in fact that's where the disciples were in Luke 11. See what's going on in our scripture reading is that they've been watching Jesus pray and they finally ask him to teach them how to pray. And what ensues is that Jesus says, okay, pray like this, and then he hands off a couple of the phrases from the Lord's Prayer that we recite each week. And then just after sharing those pieces from the Lord's Prayer, Jesus turns right around and tells them through a story to be persistent in prayer. And if you get nothing else from this sermon, I want us to, to hone in on that. you got to be persistent in prayer. Keep at it. See, this whole scripture reading, just to be really candid with you all, this whole scripture reading and this whole sermon, you're not going to enjoy it if you don't pray. This is meant to uh, teach you a methodology for you actually doing it. It's not a, a prayer or nice thoughts on prayer. It's more uh, a roadmap for it. And so let's start getting after it. We're going to take it one piece at a time. The first big section is the Lord's Prayer itself in the scripture reading. And I want us to see what we're supposed to be getting out of the Lord's Prayer. Because this whole chapter, it opens up with Jesus saying, pray like this, and then he prays like that. And so we're well aware that the Lord's Prayer is supposed to be a model for us. But I guarantee you that none of us pray in our own time, like Jesus prayed in the Lord's Prayer. Plus, of course, we're reciting it in full at church, which isn't exactly what Jesus was instructing us to do here. None of us... None of us pray like this, especially if we're praying out loud. I mean, you know the Lord's Prayer, right? It goes off in about ten different directions. It's kind of a bumpy road. And all those directions, they're good and true, but wow. See, when we pray, we tend to want something that sounds good. You know, I find myself being jealous of other people's prayers that, that just sound poetic and, and nice. It's like we want to be impressive to God. We want God to notice our stylistic choices and how many Bible verses we memorized. You know, the big ideas that he put in his own book that somehow he's going to be impressed that we can repeat back to him. That's not what Jesus is telling us to do here at all. In fact, if we were to zoom ahead to the story of the man knocking on the door at midnight, we'd see the image that Jesus has of prayer. Uh, and what it looks like is less like reading God a poem, and it's more like haphazardly showing up at a really bad time and just bothering God. That's what Jesus is telling us to do. We need to bother God more. We need to get comfortable knocking off the pretense, not trying to have a Miss America prayer, and just really connecting with who God is. So let's see what Jesus told his disciples, and then we'll circle back and we'll see what it means for us. You all know the Lord's Prayer. First it opens and it addresses God. What Jesus is doing is he's honing in. He knows who God is. He says something about who God is in relation to all of them. And then he asks for God's will to be done, not ours. That's so far so good. That sounds like a prayer we might actually pray. But then the prayer asks for bread. And of course we know that's a stand-in for everything we need every day, but... Still, that's a little disjointed. We just went from the fullness of who God is and his divine will to bread. And then it asks for forgiveness. And it asks for God to make us forgive ink. Both good things to pray for, but what happened to the bread? Then it asks God to not let us be tempted. And okay, another good thing to pray for, but do you see the pattern? It's sort of all over the place. Pretty soon Jesus says, and while we're at it, pray for deliverance too. You see, it just sort of seems to ping pong around the Lord's Prayer. Now I love the Lord's Prayer. I love reciting it in church each week together. One thing that I find is that a different word or phrase will sort of stick with me each week and work on me, but I just do not believe that this is something that Jesus just sort of shot out. I think it took a little bit longer. I think whenever we 
recall this story in our minds in Luke 11 of the disciples saying, Jesus, teach us how to pray. We sort of know intuitively that Jesus did not turn around to his disciples and say, okay, pray like this, and just shoot out the whole Lord's Prayer from start to finish that quickly. See, what I think we're missing is, is the tone and the tempo in this scripture. Often, of course, Jesus, he, he retreated to a garden. He retreated to a quiet place to pray. And he'd be there for hours at a time. And so I imagine the Lord's Prayer, it was not a, a quick poetic prayer. Imagine it was a record that was kept of the, the deep communion that he had with God, that he shared with his disciples. I think the Lord's Prayer took a while. Now, of course, I'm not advocating that next week, whenever we do the Lord's Prayer, that we spend 45 minutes on it. It's fine that we go through it quickly, but I want to highlight how I think it went, because I think when Jesus originally shared it, it had a level of contemplation to it. I bet pretty much everything started out as we started it out. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. That was probably as quick as, as we do it, but I imagine after that there was a pause. I bet Jesus, he probably spent some time there. Maybe we ought to spend some time there. Figure out what are we even about to bother God with. You know, really reaching up to God in eternity and letting go of the moment. Imagine just about after every line there was a similar pause. Give us our daily bread, followed by a long silence. And thinking about God, thinking if we really deserve to be asking God to give us anything, considering all our faults, our, all our mistakes. So Jesus, uh, another pause. And then a little later on, God, forgive us. Probably some thinking on forgiveness, lifting that up to God, and then finally saying, and help us to forgive too. That's how I think it went. That's how all the best prayers seem to go. And good prayers, they always start with an active and a disciplined intellect. You begin with honing in with your mind. Who am I praying to? What do I know and what do I trust in when it comes to God? Say something about who he is, how you relate to him, that sort of thing. You have to find God somewhere outside of yourself and be able to stick to that. So that's the first duty. But then, what we see, if, if this way of understanding the Lord's Prayer is right, is you have to slow way down. You have to be content with a, a long, open span of just sitting with God. You know, not all slick and smooth like we tend to like our own prayers to be, but instead a, a level of contemplation, a level of opening up our heart before God. You know, it's not meant to be neat and tidy. It's not meant to impress anyone, much less God. It's meant to be stretching out your heart, knocking off the cobwebs, and connecting yourself to the Spirit of God far, far beyond what a quick turn of phrase can do. This style of prayer, it might take some time, and probably will take some intentionality. It's you searching yourself for things that you need to present before God. You know, for me, it means that I have to very intentionally turn off the TV, leave the cell phone in another room, no books, no music, no worrying what other people are up to or what's for dinner. I have to go off into a private place, and often I don't feel like I'm really getting it right until a few minutes in, a few minutes after I thought I, I had prayed everything I needed to pray. That's really all there is to cont contemplative prayer. Start with an active and disciplined intellect. You talk to God, you hone in on who God is, outside of yourself, finding God, not just more of you, and you hold on to that. You stay in the presence of God, and you start to walk through the content of your heart. No plan, no secret formula, no prepackaged prayer, nothing impressive. It's just laying it out and being messy. What will happen is you'll start with knowing what you thought you needed to say. And then as you continue to pray without ceasing, your heart will uplift all sorts of different nooks and crannies in your life. 
pretty soon you'll you'll lay out all the stuff that's gotten out of sorts and you'll let God put you back together. And by the time you get to the end of it, you won't have made much progress or sounded all that impressive or knocked much off your checklist or anything like that, but you will have placed all of yourself, your entire heart, before God and allowed him to work on it and to, to tie it back in together. Center yourself on who God is. I think the lesson to be learned here in this scripture, besides the method of contemplative prayer, is that for Jesus, it doesn't seem the specific content of our prayer was key. Instead, it was the, the ceaseless nature of a prayer that it was key. It was the never-ending closeness to God, the ability to go several minutes, maybe several hours, where you feel your presence before God. It was your ability to lay out everything down before God and trust that God sees it. That's the closeness that Jesus is trying to instill in us. Not get any specific thing from our prayer, but instead the closeness with God. That's what we ought to be asking for, what we ought to be searching for, knocking on the door for. It says, ask and it will be given to you. Search and you will find. That one's always bothered me because I've asked multiple times for a bicycle. Never got the bicycle. Y'all know what I'm talking about? But if that's not what it is, if, if we ask and it will be given to you, if we search and it will find, and that doesn't mean individual items or our specific ones, what, did it, what is it that we're supposed to be asking for, searching for? Convinced it's a closeness with God. It's, a, it's looking for God at work in us, a breakdown from us having our need and tidy life and God having his need and tidy life to something of a communion together where you sit with God and God sits right back down with you. Church, all of that is to say that this is my challenge for you all. I see so many positive fruits in this method of prayer of uplifting all that you have to God, starting with that active but disciplined intellect, honing in on who God is, and then laying yourself out before him, of doing that for some time. And so my challenge for all of you is to try that out for two weeks. Honey, put an alarm on your phone if you have to. Do it before you go to bed if you have to. But try out that method of lifting up who God is, honing in on that, and then just laying out all of what you got. In my experience, you will not get a bike. You will, however, get a closeness to who God is that that recenters you, that restores you, that makes you able to go out into the world as, as a whole person.